once again, I want to say thank you um, to my brothers, my sisters, and my non-binary families across Ghana. Uh, to my trans family, I remember you on this week of trans remembrance. And to our fathers and our mothers, our brothers, our sisters that are in the space tonight, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity as an Nigerian um, to be part of this conversation. And like you've heard, what I'm going to share with you tonight will be an experience from the position of Nigeria regarding what Ghana is currently going through. I'm going to be sharing uh, a slide with you. I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself um, and my journey in life. I'm also going to tell you a historical outline of the Nigerian same-sex marriage prohibition act which is in a way very similar to the, um, to the law that, or to the bill that you currently have in Ghana. I'm gonna try and give you an idea into the argument that I've heard over time that have been pro proposed as a reason for passing this bill, which includes uh, public opinion, which includes the argument of family values. Uh, it talks about African traditional culture and values. But also I'm gonna share with you, seven years later, after the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act was signed into law by President Goodluck Jonathan, what has been the situation in Nigeria. I'm gonna share some case studies with you. And um, finally, I'm gonna share with you what can Ghana learn from this experience of Nigeria. I think the most important thing about this is that whatever is happening in Ghana, it can be seen in relationship to what has happened in Nigeria. And we can make a projection from it, right? That based on all the analysis that we have, based on all the experiences that we have, that if this bill becomes law in, Nigeria, in Ghana, we have an antecedent to what has happened in Nigeria as a basis to evaluate it. The good thing about Ghana uh, is the fact that while this was happening in Nigeria, there was hardly any comparison, any settings, any country, any society to look at. Ghana has this opportunity. And I hope that tonight um, you all will take something out. Okay. Now, uh, like the presenter said, um, I'm not here to emotionally um, blackmail anyone. I'm here to give you facts. And mm -hmm. so before I go on, let me talk about myself. Uh, like your mother have heard, my name is BC Alimi. And I was born in Lagos, Nigeria, uh, 46 years ago. Um, I went to, I spent all my years um, in Lagos. I was actually born in a place, if you're very familiar with Nigeria, called Mushin. Um, I became aware of my sexuality at quite a very young age, actually, at the age of eight. And the reason why I became quite aware of my sexuality is because I grew up in a very big home. I'm, I'm from a polygamous family. So I have a brother and I have three other sisters with five of us. And I realized quickly that I was never like my brother. I wasn't into the things that my brothers were really interested in. And that for me at a very young age was a sense of awareness of the fact that Something about me does not fit into what the society has framed whatever condition that they frame it to be. Also, I need to say this, I grew up in a very religious home. My father is a Muslim and my mother an evangelical Christian. So at a very young age, I have heard the words. I have heard them said in churches, I've heard them said in the mosque, and I've heard them said at home about anything that is not heterosexual and the God's ordinance for all of this. And I'll try and talk about the ordinance of God later on. So I was in the consciousness of this and this consciousness played a pivotal role in my life. So much so that when I was 17, confused, angry, with no support whatsoever and no one to look up to, I attempted my first suicide. And I always like to make clear because some of the arguments you will hear tonight is that LGBT people suffer from mental health. Yes, they do. And that is true because there are signs that back that up. But what you're not being told 
is that I don't have mental health because I'm queer. I have mental health because I'm hated for being queer. I have mental health because I am conditioned to hate myself for being queer. I have mental health because of bills like this that questions my existence in this life. So because of the things that I've been fed and I've been told, I have a mental health. I did not have a mental health because I am who I am. So I struggled from the age of 17 up until the time that I was 29. When I graduated from university and I had my big break on TV, I was an actor and I came out in 2004, making me the first man to ever do that on national television in Nigeria. Again, that changed the whole narrative about invisibility. It changed the narrative about the fact that we don't know because now you know, what do you do with that information? Let's open it up, let's talk about it. What followed was so harsh. Condemnation from religious organizations, political elites felt like what I've done was an atrocity against the fundamental of Nigeria as a nation and Nigerians as a people. I was punished for it. I was punished not because I lied. I was punished not because I pretended to be something else. I was punished because I dared to live my truth. I was punished because I made a decision not to deceive a woman and marry a woman. I was punished because I made a decision not to have children that I would not love. I was punished because I dared to say, this is my life and I wanna have the opportunity to live it the way that is best. And with that, I had to run out of Nigeria. In 2007, I flee Nigeria and I moved to the UK where I sought asylum. And five years later, I became a citizen of the United Kingdom. Nigeria is in my home, Nigeria is in my heart. And as I'm speaking with you now, I'm actually speaking with you from my house in Lagos, Nigeria, because it matters to me. I am equally an African as the people who said, or the people that passed the law. I'm equally an African and equally a Nigerian as whoever we speak for or against this conversation tonight. And I think that is what is important for us because who decides who is fit enough to be an African, to be a Nigerian, to be a Ghanaian, and who decides who is fit, not fit enough to be. So let me take you through what happened when I came out in 2004. There were a lot of conversation that was going on. Less than 18 months later, because I came out in October, a bill was introduced into the parliament in Nigeria called the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act. In the parliament of 2006, it did not pass. There was a conversation that was going up and down. In 2007, in 2007, sorry, there was a public hearing in Abuja. It was, I remember that day very well. It was February 14th, Valentine's Day. February 14, 2007, we were in parliament begging and appealing to Nigerian lawmakers. On the day the world was celebrating love, we were appealing to the National Assembly in Nigeria to give us a sense of dignity. There was never at any time, and again, I know this is similar because I've spoken to people in Ghana there was never at any time the LGBT community in Nigeria, nor the LGBT community in Ghana demanded for anything. I listened to the Honorable Member of Parliament and it's talked about the advocacy of the LGBT people. The advocacy to have access to health, the advocacy to have access to medication, the advocacy so that they would stop being molested by the institution of state. The advocacy so that they be protected by the legal mechanisms that are available in the state. 
There was never, and there will never be a time, and I can say this, maybe not now, that I've been a clamoring amongst the LGBT community, either in Nigeria or in Ghana, for marriage, for, this, for the dissolution of the family, for redefinition of marriage. There's never been a time that the existence of LGBT people has threatened the idea of a heterosexual union. Never at any time. In 2013, the bill was passed in parliament and it became the Same-Sex Marriage Prohibition Act. In 2014, this bill was signed into law by the then president, good luck, Jonathan. To give you an idea of some of the reasons that were used for the passage of this bill, there was the idea that there was a clamoring for this by Nigerians based on public opinion, the Nigerians want the criminalization of LGBTQI people. There was a the idea by religious institution that LGBT people challenges the ordinance of God according to a marriage between a man and a woman. There was also the argument that the existence of LGBT people will pose a danger to the construction and the idea of the family unit. These were some of the things that were put forward. So when the law was passed, Nigeria reaffirmed one thing, that marriage should be between a man and a woman. But the law went further and the law said, any organization or groups or individual that supports same-sex marriage in Nigeria will be punished. Anyone that gets married, anybody that gets married in a same-sex situation will go to jail for 14 years. Anyone that attains such marriage will go to jail for 10 years. Any religious institution that similarizes such marriage will be fined and the head of that church will go to jail. Nigerians were not allowed to set up organizations, club, association, or even to fund those organizations or association. By this time, I am guessing, oh, this sounds familiar. Well, if it sounds familiar to you, it's because we are playing and we're singing from the same hymn book. Because the law that you have in Ghana now, there's nothing new about it. It's a template that has been passed from Russia to Nigeria and to Uganda, and now it has found its place in Ghana. But one fundamental argument that has been used for this is public opinion. And rightly so, because when Good Luck Jonathan was about to sign the law in 2014, he said there was a huge public support for this bill. But let us take a pause and remember that there was never a huge support on a political manifesto on any political party in Nigeria that when you get elected, you must go to parliament and criminalize same-sex relationship. There was never anything like that. And I'm sure at the last election in Ghana, Honorable George did not knock on the doors of his constituencies and say, vote for me, because if you vote for me and I'll go to parliament, I will pass a bill that will criminalize LGBT people. I've listened to a lot of interviews that he has given. His argument has been that there's a huge support amongst Ghanaians for this law. But what else do you expect? Isn't this a very simple game of computer? You garbage in and it garbages out. So when you feed the frenzy, you feed the people to hate a particular group of people. And then you sample the same people you're fed fear to about a certain group of people. And then you sample them to know if they fear those particular group of people. And based on their conclusion of fear, you are trying to pass a law to justify yourself. And I'm sure there must have been a place who've heard something very close to that, Nazi Germany. Because Hitler was very strategic. 
He had to fear the Germans, that the Jews are to be feared. And then he had to find a reason to support the idea that the Germans are afraid of the Jews so that he can do what he had to do to the Jews without feeling guilty about it. I'm not saying that this law is proposing a concentration camp in Ghana. But what this law is about to do is nothing short of that. So when we look at support for the law, I listened to the Honorable in one of his interview, I think with the CNN, and he talked about 97, 96. The same thing happened in Nigeria, it's a trend. In 2010, 96% of Nigerians were in support of the law. Five years later, that dropped to 87%. But it didn't stop there. When we look at the trend between 2015 to 2019, four years, 2015 is in blue, 2017 is in yellow, and 2019 is in green. You can see the way that things are shifting. And just, you know, I remembered when I did an interview with Christina Mampo the night that the bill was signed. I said, for once in my life, I am happy that finally this bill has passed. Because the repercussion will start and Nigerians will start feeling it. Because again, when you look across board, the indicators that were used to sign this bill, and when Nigerians started feeling the impact of the bill, of the law, people started asking questions. Hearts and mind start changing. And you can see the way the trend is changing and it continues to change. So I talked about what are the arguments that have been used to support this law. Divine ordinance. It's against the law of God. But the Bible reminds me that God is love. That's what the Bible reminds me. And judgment is of the Lord. That's what the Bible reminds me. It talks about procreation. And the interesting thing about procreation, we forget that procreation is a choice. But more importantly, we make people believe that if you're LGBT, you cannot procreate. And we know now that that is a lie. It is not true. But I think more importantly is because this challenges the, the patriarchy heterosexual understanding of roles and expectations. I am married to my husband. So many times people ask me, so who is the wife? Who is the husband? It's a typical question I get every time. And I said, there's no wife, there's, we're just two husbands, two people in love. So how do we tell this to our children? How do we explain it? We come to the idea, it's not good for kids. But we know science after science after science, researchers after researchers have told us that even kids that are brought up in same-sex family do equally, even if not far better than kids that are brought up in heterosexual family. But this is not a time for comparison. This is a time to diffuse this argument, to break it down. There's the argument that it is an African. It's against our culture and tradition. It challenges the essence of who we, who and what we are. I've heard that it's a ploy to destroy African tradition and our ancestors are against it. All of this, are pure emotional rant. Because there is no one that can tell me here that they know for a fact that homosexuality is un-African. There's no one here who can tell me for a fact that it challenges the essence of being an African. Because then you will have to tell me being an African is monolithic in of itself. So I'm gonna present some arguments and I'm trying to round up here. And I'm going to try and make sure that the argument that I'm gonna state here are facts, they're not emotional. So when people say it's against God's ordinance, I ask a question, which God and whose God? I don't wanna to go too deep 
But I'm going to leave it there. Who's God and what God? So when people say it's procreation, can LGBT people be parents too? The answer is fact. I can be a father. I can procreate just like a heterosexual person can procreate. We demystify the roles and the challenges of patriarchy. That's also one of the, you know, one of the challenges that this argument is presenting. And we're increasingly having data, like I said earlier, that are showing that kids growing up in LGBTQ households are doing equally, even sometimes way better than kids that are growing up in heterosexual homes. So in 2014, Gulag Jonathan signed the bill into law. The first thing that happened was the Sharia case in Bouch. It was immediate, the same week. A young man was arraigned before a court, a Sharia court in Bouchy, on the accusation of homosexuality. Two weeks after that, a group of young men invaded the homes of two people they accused of being gay in Abuja, beat them up, burned all their properties and set their house ablaze, ran them out of town. In Delta State, a young man was killed. And in Lagos, many of you will remember the case of the 57 men. These were men that were rounded up at a party by the Nigerian police, accused without any evidence of being gay. These were young people who were attending a party in Lagos. They were paraded on national television. They lost their jobs. Many of them lost their homes. Until today, many of them have never been able to get their lives back. They are brother to somebody, an uncle to somebody, a son to somebody, a best friend to somebody. And that moment would change the life, not of just theirs, but everyone that is linked to them. I am not a prophet of doom. I didn't come here to scare anyone. But this is the reality of what is about to happen in Ghana. And like I said earlier, I've listened to the honorable member. He has talked about it, it's the reason why this bill is necessary. It talked about public opinion. It talked about the fact that he's an African. It talked about family values. There is the argument of social cleansing. We need to get rid of the gays. I remembered one question that was put to him on CNN. Now, where do you want these people to go to so they can go somewhere else? Can you imagine that a citizen of Ghana is telling another citizen of Ghana, go somewhere else? Ripping away the identity the pride, the, integ the Ghanaian integrity that another Ghanaian has just because you think that you can. And this all boils down to political positioning. But more importantly, this is a situation of the voice of Cain and the hands of Abel. And what do I mean by this? There are fundamental questions that are not being asked. Why does this bill look like the bill from Nigeria? Why does it look like the bill from Uganda? It's simple. Who is funding this bill? Because if these parliamentarians are particular and interested in Ghana, then we will be talking about something that will benefit every Ghanaian. Criminalization of same-sex relationship amongst adults benefits no one in Ghana. No one. It doesn't provide jobs. It doesn't provide good healthcare. It doesn't provide good roads. It doesn't provide security. It doesn't do anything. So why is there no attention to better education in Ghana, to better infrastructure in Ghana, why there are no 
bill to ensure the increase in Ghanaian tourism to bring more money into the pocket of every Ghanaian. Why then is there a bill to divide Ghanaians, to pitch Ghanaians against Ghanaians? Why is there a bill to deny real Ghanaians the access to the commonwealth of Ghana? Why is there a bill that is going to deny Ghanaians access to healthcare, access to security, access to good life that every other Ghanaians will enjoy, just simply on the basis of their sexual orientation? Because it happened to me, and I'm just one of so many Nigerians. I am one person that I hardly had a chance to see my parents. And there's so many other people like that. There's so many other parents that are looking back and realizing they've been played. My role tonight is to tell you, Ghanaians, please don't get played. So when you live here, ask question, what really is the essence of the title of this bill? What is a proper human sexual right? What are Ghanaian family values? Do we understand human sexuality enough in Ghana to legislate against it? Do public opinion supersede the right to privacy and essence of being a person? Ask fundamental questions. Even if you are in support of this bill, be curious, ask questions because it is important. I'm gonna end with this. Hey, they come for the Jews. You don't care because you're not a Jew. Tomorrow, they come for the women. You don't care because you're not a woman. Tomorrow, they come for the people who are disabled. You don't care because you don't have disability. But remember that when they come for you, there will be no one to stand with you. This is a pivotal moment in Ghana. It's about Mbutu.